Okay, picking up with respiration, regulation, um, and then clean up all the respiratory system, we're done. All right, so some things about regulation. Lung perfusion. Um, basically, blood vessels in different parts of the lungs can dilate to get more blood into different areas of the lungs where there's low PO2 uh, for more pickup into blood. That's really about it. Second thing, bronchiolar diameter. Um, more air gets down through the bronchioles, uh, down into the alveoli. Um, the dilation is under the control of the sympathetic nervous system. The fight or flight response causes bronchodilation. There are a lot of chemicals you can take also for bronchodilation. All right, but let's get to the heart of the matter. Medulla. Let me remind you. Pons, right here, we'll talk about in a minute, but there's the medulla. Cardiac center, heart rate. Vasomotor center, blood pressure. The, rhythm, the respiratory centers, the rhythm of respiration, all lie in the medulla. Okay, dorsal group and ventral group. You see them right there. Obvious why they're called that. Let's go regular, old, quiet breathing. You're listening to this. You're not really thinking about your breathing. Just quiet breathing. Only the dorsal group is involved. It sends a message to the diaphragm and external intercostals. They contract, causes your rib cage thoracic cavity to increase in size, your, your pressure in the lungs goes down, air comes in. That's all. Air comes in. You inhale. When they cease, when those muscles cease to contract, you passively exhale, right? Active inhale, passive exhale. That's the dorsal group. Now, if you have to really force inhalation, exhalation, let's say you're exercising or you've just stopped exercising and you're just breathing as deep and as quick as you can, or you've got lung disease like emphysema. If you've ever seen anybody br uh, with emphysema, they just practically have to consciously try to breathe or shortness of breath, gasping for breath then you really have to use a heck of a lot of muscles in addition to diaphragm and external intercostals. That involves the ventral group. It not only involves more muscles, it involves active exhalation, which you don't see in quiet breathing. Remember, active inhalation, passive exhalation. They just relax. In forced breathing, you both actively inhale and actively exhale. I'll show you more in just a minute. Okay, the nerves carrying this information, intercostals to the intercostal muscles, phrenic to the diaphragm. Now, the pons. Um, its job is to help the medulla. The apneustic center uh, is involved with um, automaticity, making it very smooth, your breathing very smooth, and it also causes longer breaths. The pneumotaxic center counteracts the apneustic center and it increases your respiratory rate and you have shorter breaths. Okay. So here's a look at normal breathing quiet breathing. Um, start here. Uh, dorsal respiratory group active. Diaphragm internal intercostal, sorry, external intercostals contract. Air comes in. Now look at the green area. You're now in exhalation. Those muscles relax. Air goes out. Passive. Okay. No prob, easy. Okay, now let's go forced. Different scenario. 
DRG dorsal group is active, sends information to your inspiratory muscles. Uh, you also get some accessory muscles involved, you know, the sternomastoid and abdominal muscles and blah, 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 and you get inhalation. Now, look at exhalation. DRG, dorsal group, uh, stops. Expiratory group becomes active. Expiratory group doesn't play a factor at all in normal breathing. Um, the inspiratory muscles, diaphragm, external costals, relax, but now expiratory muscles contract. Abdominals, for example, are expiratory muscles. And you get active expiration. So again, active up here, active down here. Both active. Alright, now in order for the brain to make a decision about speeding up, slowing down, it's got to get some input from chemoreceptors. So, chemoreceptors, let me remind you where they are. We've talked about them before. In the carotids, right here, going to the brain, obviously. That's where the carotid goes. And aortic body, right over here in the aortic uh, arch. These are called peripheral chemoreceptors. You also have some chemoreceptors um, in your brain. Remember the choroid plexus is where uh, spinal fluid comes out of uh, the blood? You've got some chemoreceptors there that are monitoring um, these three things right here. The chemoreceptors monitor three things, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and pH. Of the three, oxygen is the least important. I know you're going to find that difficult to believe, but you must believe it. CO2 is way more important. Way more. You've got to have a hell of a big drop in oxygen for your nervous system to take notice. You don't need a big drop in CO2 or a big rise in CO2 for your nervous system to take notice. <coughs> now, there's a connection between pH and CO2. Remember, CO2 becomes an acid, H2CO3, carbonic acid, and carbonic acid causes a drop in pH. <coughs> okay, so look at this uh, picture on the right. Let's go through a scenario. Um, you're, for some reason your breathing is slow and you're not getting enough CO2 out. Your CO2 is accumulating and it's causing your PCO2 to go up. That stimulates your peripheral receptors. It stimulates your central receptors. They then alert the medulla, which sends impulses to the diaphragm and the external costals. And that increases your rate of breathing. And that gets rid of uh, extra CO2 and we're now returned to homeostasis. Okay, now some other things. You see a reference to hyperventilation and hypoventilation. So think what happens when you hyperventilate. You're breathing faster, you're blowing off more CO2, right? Your PCO2 in your alveoli is going to go down because you're getting rid of it. It's going to go down more than if you were just breathing normally. <coughs> so, as a result of that, because there's a, a bigger difference gradient between the PCO2 in your blood and the PCO2 in your alveoli because you're blowing it out more, there's going to be more of a transport of CO2 from blood into the alveoli as a result of hyperventilation. You're blowing off more CO2. The opposite happens with hypoventilation. Okay, herring brow reflex, sometimes called the inflation reflex. When you inflate your lungs as much as you can get them full, receptors become stimulated. Um, they send info to the brain, <coughs> and the brain is going to cause you to exhale. 
um, it keeps your lungs from overinflating and doing damage to themselves. The, pul the pulmonary irritant reflex, I think that's what I have right now. You get dust, you get whatever, down into your bronchi, your bronchioles, your trachea, and you have a cough. A cough is a type of exhalation. By the way, if you look at this diagram down here at the bottom right, here are all those receptors I've been talking about that feed info to the medulla and to the pons. Here are the stretch receptors I've just mentioned related to the hearing viral reflex right there. Um, I just was talking about the irritant reflex. There are some receptors right there. Um, conscious cortex. You can decide to hypo or hyperventilate. You can hold your breath. Um, that can, so you can actually manipulate your CO2 levels and you really can't do much damage to your oxygen levels because again you have to have huge drops in oxygen in your blood to do much of a difference, uh, much of a change. But you can manipulate your CO2, but when it becomes dangerous, believe me, your unconscious mind will take over. Your medulla will take over from your conscious cortex. Okay, the dive reflex. Um, the, as far as I can find, the max breath holding is 11 minutes in humans. But in seals, it's 80 minutes. Think about that. So they're in cold water. Uh, the dive reflex, by the way, is stimulated by cold water. You could actually even splash cold water on your face, and you could mimic a little bit of the dive reflex. It causes a drop in all your vital signs. It decreases your uh, oxygen requirements of the body. It shifts blood from unneeded areas like your skin or a seal skin, whichever, to the vital organs, the brain, the heart, the kidneys, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the two terms down at the bottom that you see, hypercapnia and hypoxia. We're going to talk about hypoxia right now. It means low oxygen. Hypercapnia is high CO2. Okay. So let's go to hypoxia. Four different places where there can be a, ca a source of not enough oxygen getting into the blood. One could be a problem in ventilation. Let's say you're in an earthquake, something falls on your upper body, um, a cement block. You're alive, but you just can't expand your lungs because you've got this heavy weight on there. If you can't expand your lungs, you can't increase the size of your thoracic cavity, you can't drop the pressure, remember Boyle's law, air won't come in. So this is a ventilation problem. This is a problem with air coming in, air coming out. Now, let's say that your ventilation is okay, but once the oxygen gets to the alveoli, it can't cross over the respiratory membrane. This would be pulmonary diseases like TB, cancer, Pneumonia, for example, in pneumonia, the alveoli fill with fluid because of an inflammatory reaction from the bacterial infection. You get edema in the uh, alveoli. Remember, you're supposed to have very little fluid in the alveoli. It's supposed to be pretty much an air sac. The only fluid is right at the respiratory membrane. And the whole thing fills with fluid, and you can't get good tr gas transport. But let's say that your lung ventilation is okay and the transport across the respiratory membrane is okay. So now we're following an oxygen molecule into the blood, but now we got a blood transport problem. How about a blood clot? It's impeding blood getting to wherever with its oxygen load. How about anemia? You don't have enough red cells with enough hemoglobin. How about carbon monoxide poisoning? Um, some, the CO is blocking oxygen from binding to hemoglobin. How about cardiovascular problems like you've had you have congestive heart failure and your heart's not pumping effectively all these things affect transport of blood if you can't get the blood from A to B then you can't get the oxygen from A to B either and then last we can have tissue demand problems for example in cancers of tissues cancer cells use way more oxygen than normal cells and they will deprive normal cells of getting oxygen thereby killing them. 
Now the shot that you're looking at down here is not normal. I mean, their feet don't look all that wonderful, but besides that, this is a shot of cyanosis. Um, this is a kind of a bluish tinge to the skin because of excess CO2 and not enough oxygen. So this is again a gas transport problem. All right. So let's now go. Let's wrap this up with some problems. Okay. Exercise. I don't think anybody should have much of a problem here. You're making a heck of a lot of CO2 in muscle metabolism. You got to get rid of it. They have to add more oxygen for metabolism. You got to get it there. So your breathing rate goes up. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. You know that. All right. So let's talk high altitude. One atmosphere, okay, at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. If you go up to 18,000 feet altitude, you're at one half of an atmosphere, and that is going to be 380 millimeters of mercury pressure, half of what it is here. The problem, remember, the greater the difference in gradient P in the partial pressure gradient between what's out there and what's in your body, the bigger the gradient, the better the diffusion. When that atmospheric pressure out there goes down, you have less of a gradient, and there's going to be a problem getting the gas exchange happening. Okay, let's go the other way. Let's go low altitude, and now we're going to go below sea level. Okay, so remember one atmosphere, sea level, 760 feet. All right, let's go down 33 feet underwater. We're at two atmospheres. Two atmospheres times 760, that would be 1,520 millimeters. Let's go down to 66 feet. That's not a very deep dive. We're at three atmospheres. All right. Three times 760, oh, it's about 2,200 and something or other millimeters. We go down to 99 feet. We're at four atmospheres. Four times 760, um, a, a little over 3,000. Uh, millimeters of mercury pressure. So you can see what happens as you get lower and lower in depth. Now this is not an oxygen. Not, not, not. Believe me, I've dived. When you have a regulator in your mouth and you got a tank in your back, the deeper you are, the easier it is to get oxygen in your mouth. It's actually easier to breathe in oxygen with a regulator when you're deep than when you're at sea level. Really. This is not an oxygen problem, unless you run out of oxygen in a tank, and that's not normal. This is a nitrogen problem. Now we get two problems. We got one problem descending, we got one problem ascending. Now remember Henry's law. Henry's law says that it is the that solubility changes depending on atmospheric pressure. The more pressure there is out there, the more soluble the gas is. And the less pressure there is, the less soluble the gas is. And that, of course, affects the PN2, the solubility of it, right? Now, right now, at sea level, I assume you're listening to this at sea level. We're about 500 feet above, but who cares? Um, you're breathing in 78% N2 with every breath. You're breathing out 78% N2. Who cares? It's insoluble at this altitude. It plays no factor in our body. But if you're down 100 feet, then remember you're at four atmospheres. And N2 gas becomes way more soluble. And when it becomes soluble, it now plays a factor in the body. For example, in the brain, where it can cause nitrogen narcosis which is a euphoria kind of akin to uh, being drunk, 
which makes you take really dumb chances like following a fish that you're looking at or wandering away from your dive buddy or you keep descending when you shouldn't be going any lower that kind of stupidity now let's say you're okay but now you're gonna ascend so now we got the opposite problem because when you drop that pressure out there because you're ascending the N2 is gonna come out of solution and it's gonna bubble out of solution and if it bubbles out in the joints it causes painful joints and if it bubbles out in the brain it can cause brain damage or if it bubbles out in other organs it can cause problems this is called decompression sickness or the bends uh, okay so let's do a wrap here problems we've talked about some of these already already talked about respiratory distress syndrome in infants due to surfactant problems, surfactant deficiency, also called hyaline membrane disease. Okay, we've talked about altitude and pressure problems. I've mentioned pneumonia. Um, also mentioned COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like emphysema, what they do to alveolar vectors, picture of emphysema right there. Here's a problem of pneumonia. Look at all the fluid accumulation in here. You're not supposed to be able to see lung tissue at all. And that edema uh, is can be seen in a x-ray. Um, cystic fibrosis, which is a hereditary problem due to too much mucus production along the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium of the trachea, larynx, and the upper bronchi. And uh, this causes it, uh, obstruction of breathing and recurrent infections, bacterial infections. And kind of talk a little bit about asthma and allergies. Uh, for example, the inflammatory reaction can cause um, bronchiolar constriction and that narrows your bronchioles and makes it harder for you to get air down into your alveoli. And last, we've got a couple of things related to your breathing rate. Uh, dyspnea is uh, pain when breathing. And apnea means not breathing. And I don't mean you just stop breathing and you die. I mean you lose a breath or you lose a few breaths. You're breathing, then you stop breathing, then you start breathing. That's called apnea. We'll talk more about that in class. That's it.